so yeah, so thank you for joining us um, today um, uh, for this special Christmas event, which is co-hosted uh, by CBA Christians uh, with, in partnership with the City Bible Forum. And before we start, uh, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional uh, custodians of this land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So for people that don't know who I am, I'm Pedro Leal, and uh, I'm a member of the CBA Christians group here uh, that meet at CBA, and I work in financial services, and I'm primarily based here in uh, Darwin Park Tower One. And CBA Christians is a group that's been running for a while some time, and it's a group of non-denominational um, Christians with a common faith in Jesus Christ. And we uh, have fellowship and meet in the name of Jesus, we gather regularly across all the various um, campuses, be it DP1, CBS, CBP North, um, South, even out at Sydney Olympic Park and also Parramatta. Well, what do we do? So we gather together to pray, support one another. We read God's Word, which is the Bible. We catch up over lunch um, for a bit of social time. And also we um, engage and support one another on, on Yammer. So do find us on Yammer um, if you're on there. So today we're delighted to have um, Dr. Sam Chan with us. Uh, you want to invite Sam to come up? So, so here, who has seen or heard Sam before? Um, massive following. I feel very, very sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Sam, you may have heard a lot about him already. So, from what I know, uh, Sam's married to Steph, mm -hmm. has three children. Right? He's a public speaker, uh, works for the City Bible Forum. He's also a medical doctor, as many of you would know. And um, I'm still yet to get an invite for karaoke because you oh, mentioned that you're man. a karaoke Karaoke probably... is so much fun. I do date night with my wife once a week and this time last year we did the craziest date night. It was open mic karaoke at the Old Manly Boat Shed <laughs> where there's a live band, a drummer, a guitarist and, another, and a bass and you get up there and you just Google the words and they will sing the song in front of 200 drunken Aussies. It's the old manly boat shed. Uh, people go there when they've been locked out of every other venue on the northern <laughs> beach. And some of this explains it's your fourth or fifth choice when everywhere else is closed. And it was the most high adrenaline thing. I got up there and I said, "Where well, I'm going to sing you the unofficial Chinese national anthem. And I sang them K San by Cold Chisel. <laughs> and I still remember in front of me was this Caucasian Aussie. He was so drunk, he was barely vertical, like just trying to stay which way is up, which way is up. And at the end, I gave him a big kiss on the forehead and I said, I love you, man. And I dropped the mic and I walked off. So that was karaoke this time last year. Old Man Lee Boat Shed, date night with my wife. What well, date night with me then? I'm waiting for your advice. <laughs> so you all know a lot of facts about Sam. I'd like to ask you, what are three surprising facts about you that people here that know about you don't know? All right, so shock, I, shocking, there is, these really are just coming randomly. Shocking fact number one, I'm a doctor, but I only just scraped through with a pass. So I got like, I, I remember like, I used to study really, really hard in high school and you get good marks. Somehow you go to university, you study really, really hard, and you just got really awful marks. So I never quite cracked the code of university, but I used to just cruise through a 51 or 52%. And I look back now and realise they must have just passed me because they didn't want to, have to, they either didn't want to come back in the holidays and give me a supplementary <laughs> exam. Because when I was in education, I taught at a Bible college, and I remember people would fail with 45%. And the head of the department would call me into the office and go, hey, hey, hey. This guy got 45%. Do you think you could go through the essay questions again? And I'll go through my essay questions. And do you think we could just find one or two extra marks and then we can give him a 50? Otherwise, you and I are back in the Christmas holidays supervising a supplementary exam. So I scraped through medicine with a pass. Uh, shocking. But you know, they say, hey, what do you call a doctor who got 51%? You call him doctor. So that's all you need. You, know, you need 51% to be a doctor. Uh, shocking fact number two, I used to play a lot of rugby. I played to up until the age of maybe 40. Uh, rugby was compulsory in my high school, so that's how far back I'm going. They could not make rugby compulsory these days. 
Uh, it was mandatory to play rugby. Somehow every Asian managed to get a note from their doctor saying they were too sick or frail to play rugby. <laughs> but I wanted to play rugby, so I played rugby and I played in university. I even played when I was in Chicago. And shocking fact number three is I used to get knocked out all the time. Like, like concussions are a real thing. So people used to run at me and I'd get ready to make a tackle and I would tell myself, this is going to be the last thing you remember for the next two hours and then you're just going and make the tackle. And my wife would have to drive me to the games because after the game I could not remember where I parked my car. And if you've ever been concussed, this is what it feels like. You know that feeling you get when you wake up in the morning and you think, is it a weekday? Is it a weekend? Is it a weekday? Is it a weekend? Can I sleep in up to get up? And you slowly come into consciousness and work out where you are. Well, that happens to me. I think, oh. I'm in a rugby field. I'm in the middle of a rugby game and I have no memory of the last two hours. And what happens is you ask the same question over and over again because you can't remember you've asked the question. And it's always, did we win? What was the score? Did we win? What was the score? Did we win? What was the score? And people just saying, shut him up. Someone <laughs> just shut him up. But at least I was asking, did we win? What was the score? Did we win? What was the score? Someone else I know kept asking, did I look good? Did I look good? Did I look good? Did I look good? So you've got to be worried. If you get concussed, you start asking uh, and talking about the secrets deepest and most meaningful to you. So you've got to make sure your heart is pure before you play a game of rugby. You will reveal too much about yourself. All right, that's how I've ever been concussed, but I'll take that. That's good advice. So you work for City Bubble Forum. Can you tell us a little bit about what you guys do, where you guys are? Oh gosh, City Bible Forum. Uh, we are everywhere and we get nowhere. How is that right? That's the best way of answering that. Well, I say, you know, if you're once a, a university student, there were all these campus groups. There was the Origami Society, there was the Rugby Society, and there were these Christian groups. And then what are these Christian groups doing? Uh, but what they do is they exist to help network other Christians with other Christians and also to help. Um, you know, for people searching, asking the bigger, deeper questions of meaning, purpose, hope, uh, we exist there to answer those questions for you. So now I'm thinking, okay, we're not at university anymore, we're working in a business district. City Bible Forum exists for that way, for Christians to network with other Christians, to pray, support, encourage each other, and also to provide those safe spaces for sacred conversations about the bigger questions of meaning, purpose, and hope. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Awesome. Well, we're really excited to hear from you. Um, guys, you've got questions, uh, put your hand up at the end, or SMS, and uh, we'll ask the question at the end. But uh, we'll hand over to Sam now. All right, thank you. Thanks, Pedro. Well, these days, we all do a lot of flying. But think about it, we are in a plane that is 500,000 kilograms of metal. How does it stay in the air without just boom, plummeting to the ground like a rock? And yet, when they give us the air safety announcement, none of us are listening. And when they tell us to look around for the nearest exits, none of us turn around. And when they tell us to put our planes on, our oh, phones on flight mode, I'm sure most of us here are not putting our phones on flight mode. Because we're thinking, oh, it's the air safety announcement, I've heard it all before. What are they going to tell me that I don't know? Why do I need to listen? What's it got for me? But just this year, Southwest Airlines flying from Dallas to New York, they had the plane crash, the emergency landing. One of the engines blew up, a bit of shrapnel went through the window, killed one passenger, depressurized the cabin, and sure enough, it happened, the oxygen mask did drop down, and this photo shows that every single passenger put it on the wrong way. It's meant to go over your nose and not your mouth. The air safety announcement, what are they gonna tell us that we need to know? Well, it seems like none of us are paying attention when we should be paying attention. And Christmas feels the same way, doesn't it? Ah, oh, it's Christmas again, blah, 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 blah. I've heard it all before. Baby Jesus, born in a manger. There were donkeys, camels, goats, and cows. What do I need to know about Christmas? I've heard it all before. Well, that's the point of today's talk. We're gonna do, and it's been titled, Three Shocking Facts About Christmas. Uh, they do not want you to know, and yes, it's shameless clickbait, but the third one will shock you the most. And so this will come in the form of a 20-minute talk from me now, and afterwards you can ask me any questions that you want. 
via SMS or you can put up your hands. So think of what questions you might want to ask and let's look at the three shocking facts about Christmas. So let's go, shocking fact number one. We actually have, because of Christmas, because of Christmas, we have way more dignity than we dared imagine. Now, this is the poo emoji, and it is in the top 10 most used emojis. It is the second most used standalone emoji. It's an official part of the emoji lexicon. It's coded, it's got its own code. What is the popularity of the poo emoji, or the poo emoji, if you're from the USA? I think it's the dissonance between the fact that it's a pile of poo, which is disgusting, and yet it's got a cute face, which is oh so cute. It's the dissonance, the subversive nature of this emoji that makes it so appealing. Because there's something disturbing and disgusting about poo. If you ever travel to Japan, you know they have these very high-tech toilet seats where they have these controls, and there's a button you can push to play music. Why? So it covers up the sound of you doing a poo. There's something very disgusting and disturbing about poo. I work one day a week as a doctor, and doctors and nurses, we can stomach anything, brains, blood, bile, butt. If there's poo, we all go, and we run away and we do not touch it and we leave to the most junior member of the team, me, to have to clean up because there's something very degrading about poo. And yet at Christmas, Jesus came to us as a baby, a helpless baby, covered in poo. And that was Jesus saying there is dignity even in being helpless, even in poo, no matter where we find ourselves, there is dignity no matter what stage or state of life we find ourselves in. So when my boys were younger and I had to change their pooey nappy, I used to joke with them. I used to say, now just remember, one day you be doing this for me. And it's sort of funny, but sort of not funny at the same time, because studies show that one in two of us in this room we will end life the way we began it, in nappies and poo with Alzheimer's disease. And the other one in two of us are going to end life having to care for that other one in two person, a person with Alzheimer's in nappies and poo. And having played rugby all my life, and having had all my concussions, I think I know which in the one and two I would be in a marriage. So I'm taking one for the team there. I'm going to be that guy. Uh, but at the same time, Jesus comes to us helpless as a baby, not talking, not walking, in nappies and poo. And my grandmother ended her life not talking, my grandfather ended his life not walking, and I'm going to end my life in nappies, needing someone else to wipe my bottom. And Christmas actually says, you know what? That's okay. Because the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, at the top of the pecking order, became one of us, not just one of us, but a baby, not just a baby, but a helpless baby. So that means there is dignity, more dignity than we dare imagine as a human no matter what stage or state of life we find ourselves in. That's shocking fact number one. Shocking fact number two is this. Because of Christmas, there really is such a thing as evil. Evil is a thing. Now, as you heard earlier, I'm married to Stephanie. I have three young boys, Toby, Cooper and Jonty, age 11, 9 and 7. Toby we named after dog names because Sam has always been a top 10 dog name so we went through dog names and the top dog name is actually Jack but we couldn't call him Jackie Chan because that would be <laughs> get a hard time for that Cooper we went through B names, Killian, Kilkenny, Cooper and Jonty we went through jock names so there, Jonty Rhodes, the cricket player so they're high energy, they're high fun and there was one night, it was my job to put them to bed so I read them a bedtime story around 7 o'clock, put them to bed, but then they came to my bed at 10 o'clock at night saying, Dad, we can't sleep. Can you please read us another bedtime story? And I said, I can do better than that. I pulled out my laptop computer, they joined me in my bed, and I said, let me now show you something you've never seen before. And I showed them on YouTube Pro wrestling. I said, you have never seen this before. This is WWE pro wrestling. They come in off the ropes. They're good guys. John Cena. They're bad guys. The Undertaker. And 
one, we we're watching this game, it was a triple tag team match, and we're in it, and suddenly, while we're watching this game on YouTube, in my bed, the bed starts shaking, like there's an earthquake. And we can hear this racking noise, da, 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 da. And my oldest son, Toby, says, Dad, what's happening? What is that noise? And I said, I think it's a younger brother, Jonty. And we turned around, and he was just flooded with adrenaline. He was quaking so hard, his teeth were chattering. And he was shaking the bed against the wall. He was so pumped and amped. He had never seen anything like this. But afterwards, I had to break it to them. Oh, boys, I hate to tell you this, but none of, the, none of this is real. It's all make-believe. There are no good guys and there are no bad guys. It's just a construct. It's make-believe. It just is good entertainment. And for a long time, we've told ourselves that as well, haven't we? There's no such thing as good guys or bad guys. Evil is a religious, social, political construct in the end, we're all just good people. We might make some bad choices every now and then, but we're just good people. And we tell ourselves that story so we can all get along. So we don't look for bad guys and we don't have this us versus them narrative. And so in the original Christmas story, when they say King Herod heard about baby Jesus being born and he was so threatened by another king, Jesus out there, he went and ordered the death of all the babies under the age of two, I just think, oh, that didn't happen. That's just make-believe. No one could be that evil. But just this year, I went to Israel and I went on a tour and the Israel tour guide said Herod really was a bad guy. He was a megalomaniac. He was a psychopathic killer. So this is Herodian. It's basically a man-made mountain that Herod built for himself. It was a palace, a fortress for himself. In the end, he got buried. When he died, he got buried on this site. But more than that, when he died, he ordered the death of his adult sons. He wanted his own children killed because he was threatened by them becoming a king. And so suddenly I realized Herod really was a bad guy. Evil is a thing. And I lived in America when September 9-11 happened. And suddenly we're thinking, whoa, this is evil. And I remember Time magazine uh, on the back page, on the essay section, Lance Morrow wrote the same thing. We've got to call this for what it is. Evil. It's evil. And maybe we've sort, thought the same thing with the Bali bombings, the synagogue shooting just a month or two ago. Evil is a thing. But here's the problem. Then. If evil is real, then we might have to return. What's to stop us from going back to the good guys, bad guys, us, versus them, tribalism, where we all end up in factions at war with each other again. What's to stop this from happening? Well, this brings us to shocking fact number three. And shocking fact number three is this. The line between good and evil begins in our own very hearts. So many years ago when I was a doctor, I did a very short mission trip uh, in East Africa. But in East Africa, they have a problem with mosquitoes and malaria. So to go to bed at night, you need to put this mosquito netting around you. And as you crawl into the netting, all these mosquitoes are on the outside trying to get in. And you just got to tell yourself to get a good night's sleep. They're on the outside. Uh, just trust your netting. It'll be okay. And then you can get a good night's sleep. But one night when I went to bed, outside the netting, right at face level, was <laughs> a hairy African spider just hovering above my face. And I thought, it's okay, he's on the outside, just trust your netting, he's more afraid of you than you are of him, and get a good night's sleep. So I did. But the next night, when I crawled into bed, poof, there he was again, just above my face. And I said the same thing, it's okay, he's on the outside, trust your netting, he's more afraid of you than you are of him, get a good night's sleep, and I did. But the next night, when I went to bed, poof, there he was again, just outside my face. It's all right, he's on the outside, trust your netting. He's more afraid of you, and I've got another good night's sleep. Well, the next day, my roommate comes to me and says, Sam, 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 what are you going to do about that spider? I said, it's all right, he's on the outside. My friend goes, no, 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 he's on the inside of your netting. That's why he's been there every single night, and I check, like, there he was, ba 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 ba. He was on the inside. What I thought was on the outside was on the inside. 
And that's the whole premise of this scary movie, isn't it? When a stranger calls, a phone rings, and you think the killer is outside the home, and it's only the reveal. Ba -ba 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 -ba! The killer's inside the house, and that's more scary. So the scary thing then is, evil might not just be outside us, but might also be inside us. This is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This year is the 100th anniversary of his birthday, so he's become quite a thing again. And as you know, he was a Russian patriot. He fought for the Russian army in World War II. But he said one or two things against Stalin. And because of that, they locked him up in a gulag, a very harsh gulag, Siberia, where people froze to death, starved to death, and were beaten to death. And he spent many years as a prisoner in his gulag. And he started to hate his captors, the guards, seeing them as evil people. But suddenly Alexander Solzhenitsyn had this pfft, Copernican moment and realised, I'm no different from the prison guards. If the circumstances were just changed a little bit, I would be them and they would be me. And so he writes the most famous, or oh, very famous line that we're all starting to rediscover and quote again. The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Evil isn't out there, it actually begins inside all of us. And Jesus would agree, because if you read more about Jesus in the Bible, he has this very famous talk, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says things like, why do you look for the speck of dirt in your brother's eye and you don't notice that the log, the plank inside your own eye? And then I'll say, Jesus, oh, but Jesus, I'm not as bad as you think I am. I've never stolen anything. But Jesus says, oh, but in your heart you envy. And then I would say to Jesus, oh, but I haven't killed anyone. And Jesus would say, oh, oh, but in your heart you've got grudges. And I would say, but I've never cheated on my wife. But Jesus said, oh, but in your heart you've looked at other women, haven't you? In other words, evil isn't just out there, it's in here. The line dividing good and evil cuts through every human heart. And we're all rediscovering this now. So this is Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he's a liberal, secular, atheist, Jew, Jewish psychologist lecturing in America. And this is his bestseller. It's just come out this year, The Coddling of the American Mind. And he argues the same thing. Part of what's led to this culture of safetyism, helicopter parenting, microaggressions, safe spaces, is we're all looking for witch hunts, as if the evil is out there. When Jonathan Hyde says, no, no, we need to start looking inside ourselves first. David Brooks, columnist for the New York Times, just October this year, the new Cold War, says we're in a new Cold War. We're so partisan now. Left versus right, red versus blue, liberal versus progressives. Oh, we're so tribal. He says the only way to come together again and find unity is to realise, you know what? We're all, we all have evil inside all of us, and that is what will unify us. But then if we've all got evil inside all our hearts, what's the way forward? And that's the message of Jesus and Christmas. Matthew chapter 1, when Jesus is born, the parents are told this, you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. And in there, that's the shocking fact about Christmas. Jesus didn't come just to be a good teacher. He didn't come just to be a drinking buddy. He was all of that, but more. But he actually came to save us from ourselves. We fall short, there's guilt, there's shame, and he comes to save us and to make us the people that we need to be and God wants us to be. So three shocking facts about Christmas. Jesus came to us as a baby. There's way more dignity than we dared imagine. But evil is also real, and there's more evil than we dare admit. And the problem begins with us, not out there, but inside us, but then Jesus gives us more hope than we could dream of because he will save us from our sins. Now, you heard earlier, I work one day a week as a doctor, and I work as a surgical assistant. And you think, what is a surgical assistant? My job is to hold the leg while the surgeon operates on it. Uh, a trained blind monkey can do what I do, and the only reason why I turn up to work is so that they don't find out how well the day went without an assistant. Whoa, that went well without an assistant. Why do we need an assistant? And I've told some of you earlier, the dynamic goes like this. The nurses look at the surgeon operating thing. 
I can see how that takes six years of med school. Then they look at the knee that is keeping you alive. I can see how that takes six years of med school. And they just see me holding the leg. And they think, how on earth does that take six years of med school? A trained blind monkey can do a better job than that guy. That is me, the surgical assistant. But early this year, I went to my own surgeon to get my knee operated on for an elective arthroscopy. And for professional courtesy, because I was a doctor, they let me go first. I'm first on the list, so I don't have to fast for as long. I'm done, I can be home before lunchtime. So I'm lying in the bed there, waiting to be operated on. The surgeon's there, the anaesthetist is there, all the nurses are lined up, and then someone says, where's the surgical assistant? And everyone laughs, ha, 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 he's the one lying in the bed. But my surgeon goes, no, 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 I organise cover, I organise a replacement. Half an hour later, the assistant doesn't turn up. He's forgotten. So the surgeon looks at me and says, you know what you're going to have to do? Okay, so I had to get out of bed, get out of my patient gear, put on the doctor's scrubs, and I had to work for the whole list, assisting every case, new by mouth, fasting, and at the end of the list now, I got out of the doctor gear, put the patient gear, jumped into bed, and they kept me awake and just put in all these drugs and see what they would do to me, and they were filming me, very <laughs> professional. And, and I had my operation, and it was all fun and games, but a few weeks later, I got a knee infection. So I had to go back to hospital. And at first, I thought, nah, 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 it doesn't, it's not too bad. And I didn't cancel any work, I didn't cancel any speaking engagements. But one day led to another day, led to another day, led to another day. In the end, I needed two more operations. I was in hospital for 16 days. Um, when I came out, I lost five kilograms of weight. My leg looked like a toothpick. It was stuck out straight. I couldn't bend it. And I thought, that was amazing. Like, people asked me what it was like. I said, looking back now, I felt like I was falling down a hole but I didn't know where bottom was. I didn't know when I would hit the bottom. And then when you hit the bottom, I didn't know when I was going to be able to climb back out. And so they say you actually won't get back better until you realize you're in a hole. And I think for a long time I was denying, I think, nah, nah, this will be all right. Don't have to cancel any work. It's just a flesh wound. But bit by bit, I was, no, this really is serious. I could lose a leg here. So you're down, it's something like, now this is bad, you've got to know you've fallen down a hole in order to get out of the hole. And that's sort of the message of Christmas. We have to know that we have fallen down a hole. There is a line between good and evil that cuts through our own hearts. We have secrets, we have shame, we fall short of the people we need to be. But Christmas comes to say that, you know what? We have far more dignity than we dared imagine, but we're far worse than we dared admit but there's far more hope than we could dream of because Jesus came to be one of us, more than just a good teacher, more than a drinking buddy, but he came to save people from their sins. Thanks. Wow, that was a really insightful talk. I mean, a lot of times I just uh, also sit there and wonder, you know, about you know, whether I'm evil or, or not, I don't feel like I am, but um, then you realise that things that, uh, you know, Jesus mentioned about the things that I have, be it envy and things like that, I then realise that, you know, I am um, evil to some degree, which goes to the first question. Um, someone asked, you know, I see some evil in me, but mm. I'm not a mass murderer in another way. <laughs> is, is there a scale of evil? And how does God of the Bible deal with this? Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. Is there scale of evil? I think yes. Uh, the very short answer is yes. Uh, and, and we recognize that in our justice system as well. There's proportionality. So yes, there's proportionality. And so if my kids um, with crayon draw on the walls, okay, that's unfortunate. If they kill an ant, okay, if they kill a dog, something that's a little bit disturbing, but they bully another human being, that's more disturbing. So there is a scale, I think there's proportionality. Uh, but it then leads to the next question, of, well, what is evil? And I think for a long time we didn't want to say there was such a thing as good and evil, because in the end, if all we are just atoms and molecules, really, what is good, what is evil? It's just a construct, it's a label, it's a name that we invent, 
with our laws and regulations. So they are social, religious, political constructs. Let's call it for what we are. Uh, they are. But now, now, but then again, we have these acts where they think, no, that is wrong, that is disturbing, uh, that is evil. So what is the definition of evil? Am I allowed to go into this? So it all comes down to this, well, what is good then? Some of you realise, okay, if I had a watch and I said this is a good watch, what do I mean by it? that being a good watch? Well, you'd say because it tells the time. It does what it's designed to do. If I said to you this is a good pen, what does that mean? Well, it writes because that's what a, good, a pen is designed to do, to write. So if somehow I said this is a bad watch, uh, it means it's not telling the time properly, it's not doing what it's designed to do. I couldn't then say, oh look at this watch, it's a bad watch because I tried to use it as a cricket ball and it wouldn't bounce properly. Then, well, you're not, it's not designed to be a cricket ball, that's the wrong criteria. So the criteria for good and evil is design. Are we doing what we're designed to do or are we not doing what we're designed to do? And suddenly for that to work, realise there has to be a designer. And that's what we didn't want to say. Uh, that we want to say we're just atoms and molecules, but if we want to say, no, there is good and there is evil, there actually has to be a designer for the design. And so, in the end, what is the evil in us? Ultimately, we're not living how we're designed to live. And Jesus in the Bible said, ultimately, it's all about being in a flourishing, rich relationship with our Creator who loves us, made us, and saves us. And in that umbrella, are we living according to our design? And if we're not, we're living against our design. Well, thanks for that. Before I go into some other questions that come through on the phone, is there anyone on the floor that would like to ask some questions? Um, Sam, I'm just going to ask, seeing that you've got two PhDs. Um, just one PhD. I thought you had two. Oh, the doctor, the medicine ones, you know, I don't know why they call us doctors. It's a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so my question was, you still work as a surgical assistant mm. and you work for City Bible Forum. How do you manage those conflicting priorities, you know, in terms of, you know, emergencies and, and sort of ongoing training and all that sort of requirements? Is it something that you manage quite well or is it a bit of a challenge? Uh, well... It gives, comes down to what is the nature of work? Like why do I work? And there are many levels we understand. What, what is the purpose of work? Like why do I get out of bed? Why do I work as a doctor? Why do I work with City Bible Forum? Well, starting at the base level is to pay the bills. And the Bible would say the same thing. The Bible says work, so we, don't, we can be generous, we can pay the bills, and we don't become dependent upon other people. So we work to pay the bills. Uh, but the second reason why we work is we all find purpose in work. Somehow work is inherently purposeful and sometimes we can't see the purpose of it because we're a small cog in a big machine. But that's where the Bible says we just trust God has the bigger picture. Right now we're just seeing the jigsaw puzzle piece uh, but there, there's a bigger thing going on here. And that's why the Bible has this verse says in the end you're not working for the bosses of the company, you're actually working for Jesus. And so he's there's a love, there's a wisdom, there's a justice, what he does. And maybe the ultimate reason why we work is the Bible says God himself is a worker and he takes delight in working. So somehow if we image God and if we have the dignity of God, somehow work is, is very um, meaningful just in and of itself. And we know that feeling when we mow the lawn. And I remember one day I caught my dad staring out in the backyard. I thought, what is he doing? I thought, oh. He's just looking at the lawn. He's just mowing the lawn. He's just taking a satisfaction in that. And somehow work gives us that same satisfaction. You know, oh, that's an Excel spreadsheet. Just <laughs> all lying up. Look at all for me in the humanities. Look at my Word document. I've got the fonting, the spacing, just right, just rock white space, rule of thirds. So I think there's a delight in that. But then your question is about priorities, is that right? Yeah, so say for example, I don't know if you're on call for your surgical work or, mm. um, you know, is it just one day that, and that's it? But do you ever find conflicted about what, what should be your focus or what, what, where your calling is, I guess? Yeah, so on the one hand, in ethics, we talk about virtue ethics. The question is who ought I be, not who, what ought I do. So if I begin here, who am I? So I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a worker, I, I, I image and I take delight in God's glory. 
and then from that should fly out what to do rather than what to do uh, determines who to be. So begin with who I am, what am I in relationship with, and I think it comes down to stages of life. So the Bible talks about stages of life. There's a chapter there that says, when you're single, you can devote yourself fully to the work of the Lord. When you're married, you can't. You have to devote yourself to your wife. That's what it says. And there's also in the Old Testament, you know, don't send a soldier off to war in their first few years of marriage. And so I remember, I used to love running marathons. And marathons mean at least one day we get, you have to go for a long three-hour run. And when we had no kids, I said to my wife, can I go for my long run? She'd go, oh, yeah, go for it. And then when we had one kid, can I go for my long run? She'd go, yeah, knock yourself out. But when we had two kids, I'd say, can I go for my long run? And she'd go, oh, are you sure? <laughs> and when we had three kids, I'd say, can I go for my long run? And she'd look at me, you're kidding me. I you? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's recognising stages of life. And Stephen Bidoff, who wrote Manhood, Raising Boys, Secrets of Happy Children, talks about how boys from zero to four, they look to, they look to mum for leadership. So as a dad, your job is actually quite limited. Just put them to bed, put them in the bath, that sort of thing. But from four to 14, they look to you for leadership. 14 onwards, they look to some other person for leadership. So if you have children between four and 14, um, Steve Bidoff says that is not the time to look for the promotion, go on the world tour, do a book, book promotion. So interesting you should ask about my job as a doctor. Surgical assisting, there is no on-call. It's quite regulated. Whereas five years ago, I actually wanted to become a surgeon again. It felt like a, a chapter that I had not finished properly. I passed one or two of the exams, but I hadn't gone on with the training. So five years ago, I thought, you know what? I'm gonna be a surgeon. I wanna be a surgeon, and then, the advice was, no, you can't, because your kids are now between 4 and 14. You should have done it before or later, but not now, because you're going to come and say, ta-da, I'm a surgeon, and your kids are going to look at you, well, well done, Dad, we're very happy for you, but where were you when we needed you? But then my neighbour, who's a careers advisor, he also said to me, why do you want to be a surgeon? So that's it, the motive of the heart. Why? And I suddenly realised all my answers would be wrong answers. I want the money, I want the status, I want the success, I want the overseas holiday, I want the eastern suburbs home, I want to have a new car for a change, and, and some of those, they're all the wrong reasons. So I think the question is, what is the motive of my heart? What stage of life am I in? And who am I? What is my identity? I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a worker that works for God to glorify God. And I think we get those things right, then the, the priorities will follow. Thanks, Sam. Got a few more questions that sure. come through here. Um, the you know you talked about you know the line between good and evil mm -hmm. begins in our own hearts, right? And we have a choice as well. Yeah. So the question is, would we have been better off without free will if it just makes us drift and takes us away from our best selves? Would we have been better off without free will? Wow, these are the questions we ask ourselves when we're uni students at <laughs> two o'clock <laughs> at night. Wow, I remember. Um, John Feinberg has a book called No One Like Him. It's an excellent piece of theology and philosophy. And he says the question is, what, would we have been better off? And maybe we can imagine a better universe where we had no free will. But John Feinberg puts it, the universe we have right now where there's free will, freedom and responsibility and relationships and accountability is probably the best of any possible world. So just leave it out there. So maybe in isolation we can imagine maybe that would be better, but what we have right now is probably the best of any possible world. Uh, so just leave it at that. Yeah. Any other questions on the floor? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just keen to know, um, every year that passes by, mm. um, Christmas becomes a bit more about like not just so much about the message of Jesus, but it has more added to it. So it's got you know, holidays, happy holidays, the whole, the whole message of happy holidays, um, people taking time off work, um, just going away, having a break, I guess, from the thing, there's presents, Christmas trees, you know, just there's a lot that goes on in that period of time. How do you go about with your family, sort of bringing the message back to being about Jesus? Yeah. That whole season? Yeah, I still remember when my boy was a little baby, and Christmas means you got to turn up to all the family things because everyone wants to see the baby. And by the end of Christmas, the, my poor boy, he was exhausted. And he was just 
screaming, was so irritable, because the day had been too much. We had to go to my family, to my wife's family. And I said to my dad, who's a Christian, I said, even for Christians, Christmas isn't about Jesus. It's all this other stuff. And I remember when I was in America, it was just Steph and me, and we had no family obligations. Christmas was our day. You know, we could regulate it, do it how we want it, celebrate how we want it. So I think on the one hand, it is what it is. It, it is what it is. It's taken all these extra layers of meaning, and that's okay. That's what it means to be human, to need rituals of tradition, to have family, uh, to have community. I just listened to this podcast that says, Westerners always complain, we have no community, we have no community, we have no community, and then we do community, they oh, I don't like this at all. <laughs> you know, like, I have to go to my parents for Christmas. Well, that's what community is. <laughs> so, like, it's like, so it is what it is. So it's like a rip. Don't fight it, just embrace it, just work with it. But on the other hand, you're right. Uh, so psychologists talk about we need a third space, not work, not family, but a third space where every now and then we just um, recalibrate and have a third space. And, and I think that's what we need to do. We need to build in our own little rituals of third spaces where we recalibrate and make Christmas meaningful. So for us, it might mean after church, we come back and then we, my, my, my kids and my wife, we can maybe just have one hour to ourselves before we, we, we get spawned. But I think we need to preserve these little third spaces, uh, rituals of recalibration. One last bit. There's two questions that came through quite similar in nature. Sure. Um, so, what do you mean that Jesus came to save people from their sins? And the other question was, so, why do we need saving from our sins? Yeah. So, the big message of the Bible is Jesus came as a great teacher, as a great role model, as a drinking buddy as well. It's there in the Bible. But if that's all we get out of Jesus, we miss the main point. The main point is he's called Jesus has come to save us from our sins. So on the one hand, it's a very humbling message because none of us want to feel like we need saving. I don't need saving. So men, you know what it's like. You walk into a department store. You don't know what you're looking for. You don't know what aisle they sell these things. You don't know what's in fashion more. And someone says, can I help you? We go, no. And that's our first so knee-jerk reaction. I don't need help. I don't need help. So there's something very humbling about having to ask for help. And so it's a very humbling message because I need saving, I don't need saving, he needs saving, she needs saving, not me. But that was the whole point of this thing. Like Jonathan Haidt in his book, Colleague on the American Mind, said that's why we're where we are. We look for evil in everyone else. That's why we have these witch hunts and shaming and safe spaces and microaggressions. We don't realize, no, no, we're all the same. What you see out there is also in you. So can we humble ourselves? But then the flip side, it's the most empowering message you'll ever hear because it means I don't have to save myself I don't have to pretend to be perfect Jesus is perfect I don't have to be uh, you know of status or honor Jesus has that because right now uh, someone called this time the time of exhaustion I was just listening to a podcast because we've been told we need to chase our dreams that's our message of salvation we need to chase our dreams. We need to do whatever it takes to make us happy. And because of that, we're miserable and exhausted because we can't do it ourselves. The, but the Bible's message is different. It's not saying you need to be happy. You need to be fulfilled and you'll find true fulfillment in living according to your design. And that's coming to know your designer, the God who loves you and made you. And you'll know that through Jesus. So until you do that, we will be exhausted trying to try to save ourselves, trying to pretend to be perfect, uh, trying to have an identity that's not us, trying to have the trophy family, the trophy job. Uh, he said, just come to Jesus says, I will give you rest. So what's this salvation that Jesus offers us? Well, the Bible gives us many images to explain what it is. Like if someone had asked me to explain what is marriage, I go, well, it's a certificate. Oh, yeah, but it's more than a certificate. It's vows. Yeah, it's, but it's more than vows. It's a loving relationship, yeah, but it's more than that. Uh, and you realize, wow, this is so rich. There's so many layers. And so what does Jesus save us from? Well, it begins, like he says, well, he saves us from having to save ourselves. So that's the rest. So we no longer, longer have to be exhausted. Somehow, whatever sin, guilt, or shame is in our lives, uh, the Bible says Jesus takes it on himself and he'll take it uh, away from you. Uh, and so you can understand that 
And, and the Bible uses many different ways to explain how that happens. But it's almost like, you know, there's something very touching and healing if someone comes and touches you on the shoulder because it says, you know what, I feel your pain, I'm one with you, and it's almost like they take it from you when they leave. And it's what a parent does to a son. Because every time my kids freak out, I say, you know what you need? You need a daddy hug. And I give them a hug. And it's almost like I am going to now take your burdens from you. And that's what the Bible says. Jesus comes, he's one of us, touches us, and he's the one who takes away all the sin, guilt, and shame gets put on him. And it removes it from us and gives us a brand new clean start. So on the one hand, the most humbling message we have ever have to hear, what? I need saving. But the most empowering message we'll ever have because I don't have to be perfect or pretend to be perfect or someone I'm not. Thanks, Sam. Wow. Lots of food for thought today. Um, so give a round of applause for Sam. Oh, thanks for having me. We yeah, really appreciate the time you've taken and also the Steve Bob Forum and crew that have come along as well. And we just wanted to give a gift uh, as a token of our appreciation for, for your talk today. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, so, guys. Thank you. And thanks to my City Bible Forum team for helping me find this tower. Yeah. Not a very really darling point. This is Darling Park, is that right? Yes. Okay, yeah. DP, but the other DP. Yeah. The other DP. Oh. Guys, well, thanks very much for coming again.